Father God, I thank you for fun. I thank, I really do. I thank you for joy that we have in you. I thank you for the fact that we can get together as related by blood, by the blood of Jesus, and enjoy each other's company. But Lord, the bottom line is really the reason we're here is because we enjoy your company. We want to hear from you. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to hear from you now as we look in a continuing look at this book of Jonah. And now he's, he's arriving at Nineveh, and we'll see what happens because you've written it down for us to know. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us through this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm going to be in the book of Jonah, picking it up in chapter 2, verse 10, and then reading through verse 10 of chapter 3. So if you want to follow along, that's where you turn. If you don't have a Bible and want one, need one, you can raise your hand and we'll bring one to you. Or you can feel free to get one. We have some on the back table there. So either way, if you want to have one but don't have one to follow along, just go like this. Or if that arm doesn't work, use the other one. Okay, no taker. So the story is told of a Sunday school teacher who was proud of her lesson for the day. She thought that she had presented the material quite nicely. Summing up, she asked her class, and what do we learn from the story of Jonah and the great fish? Well, an eight-year-old girl named Susie thought for a moment and answered, always travel by air. <laughs> of course, air travel didn't exist in the Old Testament time, so I hope we learned something a little more than the story of Jonah and don't travel by air, or always travel by air. So such as this, we could learn this. God is the God of second chances. So I call this message, Obedience, Take Two. Verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let a man and beast, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So picking it up in verse 10 of chapter 2, So the Lord spoke to the fish. I thought this is pretty interesting right there. So I thought I'd find out what does it mean by spoke. So I looked up the word spoke, and it means to say, to command. It's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1 all through the creation account. Then God said, let the dry land appear. Then God said, I'll make man. Then God said, I made monkeys. Well, he didn't say that specifically in there, but you know what I mean. But then God said, so it's a powerful thing. When God speaks, it's a powerful thing. Now, this is an interesting thing here. Here we're given insight into the relationship God has with his creation. Because we know from many places in Scripture that God speaks to people. Sometimes it's really clear. Genesis 6, verse 13, And God said to Noah, and then he gave instructions about the flood that's coming and about building the ark. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, Moses is fascinated by the burning bush. He sees it burning out in the desert, so he goes because it isn't burning up. It isn't being consumed. It's still on fire. And it says, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. The Bible says they talked as if a, the way a man talks to another man face to face. Luke 3.22, 
This is when Jesus has been baptized. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. And then Matthew 17, verse 5, at the transfiguration of Jesus, when he was transfigured, he was transformed and changed, and all of a sudden they could see him in his glorious state, which is one commentator said something so awesome. He said, it isn't so amazing that he was transformed into his glorious state. What's amazing is for 33 years, he hid that from people. (laughs) That's what's really amazing, because that's what he is. He's glorious. But at the transfiguration, God the Father shushes Peter. If you remember, Peter said, it's good that we're here. Let's build a tabernacle for you, Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And one of the gospels says he said this because he didn't know what else to say. (laughs) I've personally done that a lot, said things when I didn't know what else to say. (laughs) And usually I'm sorry. So God shushes Peter because he says, while he was still speaking, while Peter was still talking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, Peter, listen to Jesus. Stop it. (laughs) And then in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, the last one I'll bring up, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, when he eventually becomes Paul the apostle. Then Paul, he, Paul, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And of course, that was Jesus. So we know God speaks to people directly, and I think he still does it today. Sometimes it may be almost like an audible voice, but we know that he speaks to us when we pray, and we know that he speaks to us through other people, and he definitely speaks to us through his word. What's amazing is the ink isn't any different. The letters aren't in any different order. The words are in the same order, but you can read something and go, oh, there's the answer to my prayer, and it is, it's a story about something totally different than what you're going through. So he speaks to us through his word. But did you know that God also speaks to his other creatures, his other creations? In this case, a fish. God speaking to a fish. Now, I have tried this. Not talking to fish, but I've asked God to speak to fish on my behalf. <laughs> Standing on the shore, cast it out, say, God, would you please have a good-sized fish? Be attracted to the bait on my hook. Bite it, swallow it, do whatever it takes to hook him so I can reel him in. Having caught fish before, I can't say God didn't talk to him for me. (laughs) Never caught the big one. I'm no fish whisperer. But you know who is the fish whisperer? Is God. God speaks to his creation. In Isaiah 48, verse 13, Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. It's like when God talks to the heavens, they go, yep, God's talking. Don't move. The Bible says he knows the number of them, all their names, and not one of them's missing. You ever look at the Big Dipper and there's one of the squares missing? You, it's the big emptier. It's not going to dip anything without that bottom star. No, it's always there. Not one of them's missing. And it's not even the only time that God spoke to a fish. This is pretty cool. In Matthew 17, verse 27, Jesus was talking with Peter because the, the Jews asked Peter, does your preacher guy, your rabbi, pay the temple tax? He says, sure. Then he's like, do we? <laughs> I guess. Because Jesus wasn't with him, but he comes in with the room where Peter was, and he starts answering Peter. Before Peter has a chance to ask him, it says Jesus answered him. Like, answered what he was thinking, I guess. He, he says, who should pay? The, does, does the king charge his children tax? No and the children are exempt. They're free. But, he says in Matthew 17, 27, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. And I'm like, man, I want to fish there. (laughs) You get fish and you're professional because the fish pays you to catch it. So this seems pretty clear that God spoke to that fish in particular. Said, swim along and you see that coin, bite it. Don't swallow it. And then you swim along and you see a hook come down. I know it's a hook, but just bite it. And then he'll pull you out and allow him to open your mouth and he'll take the coin out. It had to be because it happened. So God, it's not even the first time that God spoke to a fish. So it's easy to see from the point of view of Scripture, 
to see that God can and does speak to his creation. In this case, it's a fish. So what did he tell the fish to do? And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. (laughs) So I'm a guy. Guys are interested in gross things, smelly things, stinky things, weird things. If something's iffy in the fridge, I'm the one who smells it. I'll take it out. Oh, what's that? Well, that looks kind of bad. It is. Whew. Put the lid back on. If there's another guy there, are you sure that's bad? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's bad. I told you, you know. (laughs) Guys are like that. And they'll get a stick and poke it or do whatever. My son used to like to make potions with his meal. When he was done eating, he'd just mix all the food together. He does it at restaurants. Stop that. (laughs) Boys are weird. So I wanted to look up the word vomited. See what it means. It means to vomit up, cleverly enough, to spew out, to disgorge. Isn't that a fascinating word? I guess gorging yourself is eating, so disgorging would be launching the food out. Like in cartoons, you know? (laughs) Webster's defines the word spew as to come forth in a flood or gush. This is what this fish did. I can't speak for you. I do it sometimes, but I I shouldn't. But personally, I hate to vomit. I just do. I can't stand it. It's violent. It's messy. It smells. Now, I don't know how the fish felt about vomiting, but this fish prepared by God for this mission had to vomit Jonah out onto the dry land. Now, as far as I know, this fish didn't have legs or feet to crawl up onto the shore. You guys remember the movie Jaws? When it first came out, my wife and I went to see it with the guy who was the best man at our wedding. And she drew the cutest little drawing. You know, the slogan was, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, was Jaws 2. So she said, just when you thought it was safe on land. And she drew a shark with little legs and said, pause on Jaws. (laughs) And there's a guy running going, ah, so cute. I think I still have that drawing. Is it in the guest book? that we used to have? Oh, yeah, I think so. Anyway, if I find it, I'll show you. But I don't think this fish had legs, so vomiting or launching Jonah was the only way to be sure he would get to dry land because the fish could only get so close, and then, whoo, there he goes. Now, Nineveh is about 500 miles from the shores of the Mediterranean, so it's unlikely the fish vomited Jonah onto the dry land at Nineveh's gate. That would be quite a hurl. <laughs> Just 500 miles away. <laughs> be in the cartoon, you see a little cloud like in the Bugs, Bu- oh, the Roadrunner, right? <laughs> now, Nineveh is located east of the Tigris River. So some people, i have even seen it in a few um, commentaries, they speculate that the fish swam up the Tigris River and vomited Jonah at the very gates of Nineveh. Now, that's possible. If that were the case, though, it would have had to get to the Persian Gulf. And here's the, well, for your point of view, the map, Mediterranean Sea, Persian Gulf's over here, a lot of land in between. So we'd probably have to go down, swim around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, to get up there in three days and three nights. That fish is humming, you know, (laughs) pretty fast speeds. I can't put it past God to have the capability to basically give the fish in Jonah a little personal rapture and drop him over there. That could happen. You know, I mean, he talked to the fish. The fish swallowed him without chewing him, kept him alive for three days without digesting him completely. So who knows? You can't say that. But I personally feel that Jonah was vomited on the shores of the Mediterranean. Now, we're not told in Scripture where he did that other than the fact that he was on dry land. But I think if he got vomited on the shores of Med- the Mediterranean, it would require an effort still to get to Nineveh. If he's barfed out right there at the gate, it's kind of like, well, I kind of have to do it now. But here it requires his obedience. And I think that's what God's looking for. It's a testing, if you will, by God, of Jonah's somewhat newfound willingness to obey. Okay? <laughs> If the fish vomited him in the shadow of Nineveh's walls, it's not too hard. But he has to want to go in order to get there from 500 miles away. I've seen God do things this way in my life. Now, I'm not talking about 
being swallowed by a fish and vomited out on the land. But my wife and I got to know each other. We knew each other in high school, but we got to really know each other when we worked together at a jack-in-the-box restaurant in Huntington Beach, California, near Five Point Shopping Center. And we got to know each other and got to know each other pretty well. In fact, we started seeing each other. So when we quit, we're able to move on to other jobs. We promised that we would never, ever work fast food again. So that was in 77. Fast forward to 1982. We moved to Idaho. There's quite the financial crunch, and we can't get a job anywhere. So I got a job at Wendy's. She got a job at Burger King. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> it's as if the Lord said, how badly do you want a job? show me. And we weren't really showing him, we were showing ourselves, because he already knew. We each only had to work one day, and then we got a better job. In fact, it's so funny for her, she got a job eventually at the Idaho Housing Agency, which had her already on their phone list. They just forgot to tell her they hired her. <laughs> so they called her when she's applying for another job. You didn't take the job, did you? We, we want you. <laughs> it's a better job, so she took that one. But God deals with us in reality. How badly do you want to obey him? When he calls you, when he tells you to do something, when it's clear, he will provide you with opportunities to show him, such as Jonah having to go 500 miles. That's why I believe that's where he was vomited. This is Jonah's chance to show the Lord that he meant business. So chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, what we see here is proof of Romans 11.29, that the calling of God is permanent. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Once again, we see it's not Jonah's idea to go there. He wouldn't have thought of this in a million years. It's God's idea. But there's another thing to see here. It's very comforting to us. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Did you catch that? Did you see that? Did you hear it? As John Corson says, listen, I want to listen, listen, the second time. God gave Jonah another chance. Jonah did the exact opposite of what God Almighty told him to do. And then he tried to hide from God. And he endangered other people's lives in the process. But God gave him a second time, another chance. Because God is the God of second chances. What if Jonah got up on the beach after being barfed out of the whale, fish, sorry, and he turned around, went back to Joppa, got on another boat, and sailed away again, or went some other place away from where God told him. I firmly believe that God would have worked on him until he repented. I base that on the fact that God uses Jonah in this story, and he was going to be sure to use him, so he's going to keep on working on him. We know it was God's idea, so God will see it through. Have you ever needed a second chance with God? Have you ever been told by God to do something and you know it and then you don't do it? Just to boil down to this, have you ever disobeyed God? (laughs) I have good news for you. He has a second time in store for you or a third time or a fourth time or a fill in the blank with your numbereth time. He still does. Now maybe you've already experienced that Or maybe it has yet to happen, but I tell you this, it will. Because God has plans for your life. And speaking of listen, listen, listen to this. God bought you with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He didn't do that so you could just sit around being saved. He has stuff for you to do. He wants you to do it. But if you've blown it, take heart. Because on the cross, in John 19, verse 30, Jesus said three words. It is finished. He didn't say it is finished if you always get everything right the rest of your life. No, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on your behalf is perfect, it's complete, it's total, and it's eternal. Very comforting which should inspire us to do anything God calls us to do. Because if God calls us to do it, you know what? It's a good idea. If God's calling us to do it, it's a good idea. And how can I say that with such confidence? You know why. Because God is good and all the time. So here's what God told Jonah. And he's fresh out of the fish. 
Verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. See, this is a little different from the first command that God gave to Jonah. Back in chapter 1, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The first part's the same, actually word for word. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. But that's the point where the differences begin. In the first calling, God told Jonah some extras, a little more information. Nineveh is wicked. I've heard about their wickedness. I want you to cry out against it. But here God is a little less instructive. It's almost as if Jonah can't handle more than one instruction at a time. Well, he is a guy. We don't multitask, right? Go, okay. <laughs> Go and pick this up. Then you get to the store. So glad with cell phone. What was I supposed to get again? How could you forget? You went there for what you wanted. Just what was I supposed I got here. Give me credit for that. What do you want me to get? That's what we do. Single tasking, not multitasking. Perhaps God was saying this. Go to Nineveh. When you get there, I want you to preach against it. Details to follow. Stay tuned. Reminds me of the father of our faith, Abraham. Back when he was still called Abram, he received this instruction from God in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Imagine that. So Abram's been living there. He's got the suitcase out on the bed, taking stuff out of the dresser, and he's putting it in the suitcase. What you doing? Packing. What you packing? Everything. Where are you going? Don't know. You're packing, you're going somewhere, and you don't know where. Right. How will you know when you get there? He'll tell me. That's the way it was. And Abram just went. He just did it the next day. Time to go. God didn't give Jonah many details. I'll tell you this. He doesn't always fill us in on the details. In fact, most of the time, a lot of the details are left out. God was very sneaky. He did not tell me what he was doing when he had me at Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach, California, start teaching Sunday school. I'm just teaching little kids. It's just kids, right? It's just teaching. They have needs, so I can do it. Then we came to Idaho, Calvary Chapel, Boise. Hey, we know how to teach Sunday school, so I started doing that. We went from nursery all the way up, and I, I taught through high school, just grade by grade, or maybe third and fourth, fifth and sixth, seven and eight, something like that. And then young adults. And then I was teaching the new believers class for six and a half years. It's a 10-week class. Teach them, every, just keep cycling through, take, teach it again and again. And I was teaching two different home fellowships. And I taught a class to men about sensitive sexual problem issues called every man's battle. And then I also served as an elder at two different churches. And then surprise, God says, now I want you to be a pastor. I'm like, I can't do that. Are you kidding? He says, you've done everything you need to do. You've done all the jobs in the church. What do you mean you can't do that? Well, well, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> you didn't tell me that's what you were doing. It's kind of sneaky, but it's what he did. He doesn't always let us in on all the details because if at the beginning, back in California at Calvary Huntington Beach, when we thought we'd raise our hands and sign up for Sunday school, he says, I'm doing this to prepare you to be a pastor. I'll put my hand down. I'll stop that. Are you kidding me? I'm not doing that. In fact, a lot of the times he leaves out almost all of the details. And I think it's called building our faith along the way. So how does Jonah respond to the Lord's instructions? So Jonah arose. Yeah, we heard the Jonah arose part last time. And then he went to Joppa, right? But here he went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. So how did he respond? In this case, for this part, perfectly. Because that's what God said to do. So he did it. The instructions were according to the word of the Lord, and this time Jonah obeyed. I'm going to fill you in on something if you don't know it already. God is so much bigger than we are, and he sees the big picture from the beginning. You see, God had people in Nineveh that he wanted with him in heaven. And so he sent Jonah to preach to them. And this is how the gospel spreads. Now, some of us might think, well, if it's that important to you, why don't you tell him, God? You'll get it right. 
I'll mess it up. I'll leave something out. I'll be afraid. I won't go. I won't talk to that creepy guy. I won't do whatever. But you love him, so you do it. But God has us tell them. And they will respond to him in us better than they will respond to him directly. Think about it. When Jesus was here, how many followers did he have for his entire ministry? He had a lot of them, but as soon as he mentioned the eating my flesh and drinking my blood, a lot of them went, okay, got to go, mom's calling (laughs) or something. Got to get out of here. This is getting kind of creepy. And that's when he looked at the 12 and he says, are you going to go too? And Peter says, Peter said, you know, shush by God, Peter. He says, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. But he didn't have a lot of followers. But after he died, rose from the dead, sent it into heaven, the followers just increased because people who believe in him and believe in him as their savior and have him as their savior told others. And as one pastor says, their sheep, healthy sheep, begat more healthy sheep. You share the word, other people believe. Is there anybody here who didn't hear about the gospel from somebody else at some point in their life? If you're saved now? Probably true. That's the way God set it up. Christianity really began to spread through people, and it works. 2,000 years later, it's still working. But of course it works. It's God's plan. (laughs) God wants people in heaven. He wants them saved, so he wouldn't come up with a plan that's not going to work very well. So, going on. In verse 3, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. I found a picture on the internet of a rebuilt gate that used to guard the entrance, one of the entrances to Nineveh. And what they did is they, they found the foundation. I don't know if you know this, but at one point, they didn't know where Nineveh was or had been. So they thought the whole book of Jonah was, could be discounted from the Bible until by accident, an archaeologist found it. And they started realizing from the relics and the writings and think, oh, this is the city that supposedly didn't exist. And by the way, just so you know, I think it's the modern city of Mosul is right by it, if not on it, very close. So that kind of gives you an idea in the Middle East where it is. But they rebuilt this gate to just kind of give you an idea of the majesty of it. And it's an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. What this means is Nineveh is impressive structurally, not for what the people stood for. Because later in Jonah, God says there were 120,000 people there. It was 60 miles in circumference with 1,200 towers that were 200 feet high and surrounded by a 100-foot-high wall with a foundation that was made of polished stone, and it was wide enough at the top that three chariots could drive on it side by side. Inside the city, there were magnificent palaces, including courtyards covering more than 100 acres. The roof of the king's palace was supported by beams of cedar on top of columns of cypress and inlaid and strengthened with bands of sculptured silver and gold. Hanging gardens filled the city with rich plants, and there were even rare animals in there. They had temples, palaces, libraries, and arsenals, of course, because of their warring ways. And they all abounded to enrich the city almost beyond belief, a lot of it built by slaves. Certainly by architectural standards, it's an exceedingly great city. And then a three-day three, three day journey in extent, the New Living Translation says, the city is so large that it took three days to see it all. So obviously that's very large. So what happens when he gets there? Verse 4, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. That's all we're told about what Jonah said to the people in Nineveh. If that's all he said, and it's all we're told that he said, he really didn't say much at all. And it makes you think, boy, he really didn't want to be there, did he? Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> it's just like you almost say it and run away. Not by numbers of words, but what he said was powerful. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Somehow, I think these people knew the message was from God. Perhaps Jonah said more. Other commentators speculate that he probably did. Perhaps they recognized him as a Hebrew and realized he had some clout with God, which brings up an interesting point about recognizing him. What did Jonah look like now? (laughs) Did being in a great fish for three days and three nights alter his appearance at all? 
There are recorded cases of people being in the belly of a fish for a few days, and the digestive juices alter how they look. Their hair falls out, their skin gets really bleached. They look pretty nasty, and I've heard that it's permanent once it happens. If this is the case, people might listen to him. You know, he's got seaweed wrapped around his head. It's like that person that eats a salad and gets a piece of green on their tooth, and you're like, you got something? It's right there. Oh, just forget it. And he's preaching, and he looks at you, and he goes, repent. <laughs> Whoa, dude, I think we better. If God does that to the person that's supposed to come and warn us, what could he do to us? You know, who knows exactly what happened? All we do know for sure is Jonah said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, why 40 days? Well, there are times in Scripture where 40 seems to kind of represent a period of probation, like a period of testing, a time frame used by God to see if changes will be made. In the Old Testament, after Moses killed the Egyptian, he fled to Midian, where he spent 40 years in the desert tending flocks. He was 40 years old when that happened. So it's been said that Moses took 40 years to become great in his own eyes. It took 40 years for God to make him realize he's nothing so God could use him for 40 years. Which means how old was he when he started? He was 80. So if you think you're too old to be used by God, <clears throat> Moses was 80 and he worked until he was 120. By the way, God, I do not want to work until I'm 120. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I'm only halfway there now. Halfway, almost, a little past it. Anyway, so Moses was on Mount Sinai for... 40 days and 40 nights. All these references are in your notes. Moses interceded on Israel's behalf for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. The law specified a maximum number of lashes a man could receive for a crime, the limit being set at 40, which is where they get 39 lashes from. You don't want to go over 40. If you go over 40, then you got to get beaten. So you better make sure that 39 is good. <laughs> One lash makes no difference. The Israelites wandered how long in the desert? 40 years. Before Samson's deliverance, Israel served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David came and slew him. When Elijah fled from Jezebel, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. So this is another case of God using the number 40 as a time frame. In this case, it's 40 days. Now, how did the people of Nineveh respond? I mean, these people had quite the reputation. Killing people, marauding, maiming. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fat. Notice they didn't say they believed Jonah. So Jonah presented it somewhat properly because they believed the God who sent him. Proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Sackcloth, of course, like a burlap bag. It's uncomfortable. It's itchy. It's supposed to be. You're in mourning. Now, the people certainly responded favorably to what Jonah had to say, but it does say they believed God. It doesn't necessarily say they believed in God. But I believe that they believed enough to have salvation come. But even more than that, commentators say that specifically that was written, it may indicate how seriously their descendants took their repentance. Because 100 years later, they were just back to what they were doing before, and God wiped out the city. That's why for years people thought Nineveh didn't exist. It was because of unbelief. But for now, verse 6 so powerful that then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and stopped all that nonsense. No, he laid aside his own robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Sitting in ashes is a form of mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, sadness. One of our kids whose name I will not tell you, won't even tell you gender, was known in our family for sitting among the ashes. It used to amuse us. There, that child goes, sitting among the ashes again. So we know what that kind of, that didn't physically, but pretty close. So this repentance thing that's going on in the people, it's contagious because amazing things are happening in Nineveh. Even the king is repenting. And when the leader of a nation repents, more of the country follows. It's just true because they're looking to him for leadership. So verse 7 speaking of the king, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. So now the king makes repentance the law of the land. Can you imagine if that happened in America? How awesome that would be. Got a constitutional amendment, we shall repent. Anyway, 
I can imagine a town crier, guy grabbing his paper and coming out and standing and getting a big audience in the town. And they posted these things on posts, on buildings, billboards, sometimes crooked, sometimes this way, sometimes with a knife stabbed in it, whatever it takes. But I could see the guy reading it. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? I can imagine that, like, like the old things, hear ye, hear ye, and ringing the bell to get people's attention. These people are taking this thing seriously. So what happened? Well, the people responded favorably to the king's decree because true repentance is not only an outward thing. It has to come from the inside. These people were so repentant that they literally put sackcloth on animals, which is what the king said. And don't feed them food. Don't give them any water to drink. Real repentance changes a person from the inside out. If it's just on the outside, it's a surface thing, that you won't stay with. But if you change the way you think, the way you believe, it's from the inside out. And that's how God does his work. So God saw what they did. Verse 10, then God saw their works. I thought we weren't saved by works. You know that we're not. It's by grace we're saved. But works show our faith to other people and even to ourselves and certainly to the Lord. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Now we'll get into this more next week, next time we get together because of Jonah's response. But how God felt about Nineveh's repentance, there's, there's one slide that I wish I could have shown you today. What it did is I found it and it has the sky with a bunch of clouds and it has a bare man's arm poking through going like this. <laughs> looks really cool. That's God's response. Yeah, good job, guys. I told you. I sent him. He warned you, and you did it. You repented. You did so well. I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. Pretty amazing. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9. These are both New Testament references, but still they apply. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that the, the, your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Because there's worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And worldly sorrow is just because you got caught. But godly sorrow leads to repentance and you never regret it. That's what that does. And then Acts 3.19, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. That when you repent and come back to the Lord, you get refreshed from him. You get those times of refreshing. You feel better. You are doing better in your walk with him. So Jonah's obedience brought about two things. One, the repentance from the people of Nineveh, and here's a new word, and relentance from God. And you're saying, well, that's not really a word. You know what? Every word was made up sometime, so here's a new one. So Jonah is what I like to call a powerful, reluctant preacher. Some people call him a disobedient one, but he was only disobedient for a certain amount of time. Then he eventually did it. And because... The reason I believe he's powerful is because the power is not Jonah's. The power is in the Lord and in his word. That's all we have to remember. When God calls us to do something, he's going to accomplish it. It's his power. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your power. Thank you for you. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for saving us. Because we don't deserve to be saved. As some people say and ask, why do bad things happen to good people? I like the response that there are no good people. Person to person, we can make comparisons and say he's better than she is, she's better than he is, they're better than they are. But any of us, compared to holy God, we fall so short. The amazing thing is that anything good happens to any of us at all. We live in a sinful, fallen world, but we can rejoice because you have overcome the world. And we are yours. 
And that's the message that the world needs, whether they know it or not. I pray, Lord, that we would be obedient to you when you give us a task, because it is a good idea if it comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.